Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Emily Woodbury. Last week, health and education leaders in St. Louis County and the city released a set of guidelines that schools can use to decide how to conduct in-person learning. The list includes things like staggered lunch times, protocols for health screenings upon entry, and guidance on mask usage for students and teachers. With me now to share his thoughts on these new guidelines is Superintendent Art McCoy of the Jennings School District. Superintendent McCoy, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's start with this idea of social distancing. We know you can't expand the walls of your classrooms, um, and class sizes were a concern even before the pandemic. How confident are you that students will be able to stay six feet apart from each other in, in classrooms, gyms, and on buses? So I want to say that we in Jennings School District were the first district in the state of Missouri in a highly impacted COVID area, 63136, which had the highest numbers in the state of Missouri, to resume classes and to resume schools and reopen schools. And I believe we were probably the first in the country, for sure, if not one of the top three in the country, to resume classes in a top high transmission COVID uh, SIP code. And so I can say that we are doing it, not what we plan to do, but what we are doing for the now second week of school uh, with our pilot that's real running. We are distancing our students by six feet when they're active in classrooms, as well as really by a standard of 13 feet to double that and then add a little bit more to it. So as they're eating in the, cafe, in the uh, gym space or eating in hallways or eating in the classroom, we have approximately 30 square foot of distance so that it's six feet in all directions at all times. So uh, it, it, we have fifth graders through 12th graders present with us and not preschoolers through third grade. So it may become more difficult with the little ones, but with the uh, older students or students that are fifth grade through 12th grade, it is not only possible, it is occurring. It does take a lot of concentration and focus and, prof and, and professional development and preparation with your students, staff, and parents and stakeholders. We've had assemblies with our students to say you are making history, you are showing how education will be, and your actions will keep everyone alive. Because we start with the assumption that people will come into the building with COVID. You're not going to screen out everyone, but you want your practices to be so strong that there is no transmission of COVID. And as you mentioned you have uh, fifth through 12th grade students right now attending classes in person, except I believe that's about less than 100 students. Do you feel that once the school year resumes in the fall and you have more students that what you're doing now will be possible? I do think it will be possible once we have all 3,000 students come back to our system, it will be possible. Uh, and I have my principals coming through to do shadowing and to see and observe the procedures that's been put in place and the practices. But let me walk you through what a typical start looks like in a typical um, uh, day of school. So this, the parent drops off their child or the, or the uh, school vehicle. Uh, when we use school vehicles, of course, everyone on the school vehicle wears a mask and the students enter a bus from the, and go to the back and then go up with the driver not being uh, either on while they're entering but stepping outside to greet them without the keys and without anything running uh, and then they go to the back and then you load until you get up to the first three rows of the bus and then they come to school. Short period of time, less than a 15 minute ride, which is one of the rules that I learned as a contact tracer. So I'm a certified contact tracer from the Johns Hopkins uh, University course, which Johns Hopkins is a leader in uh, COVID testing data and more. So they come to the school setting and ultimately they get checked and screened at the door. Their temperatures get screened, but they also get the, the questions, 10 questions about COVID because we have a rubric for that's essential for students that's different for adults. Uh, the high look for us for students are coughs, difficulty breathing, and or no taste and smell. Those are the high risk factors for COVID. A fever is a low risk factor and a kid does not likely have COVID if they have a fever. Diarrhea is a low risk factor and does not likely have COVID. So the rules are different for children. They get that screening with an adult, a nurse, or a trained professional. Then they go to the classroom and they get the follow-up screening by paper or online that every adult has to do online before walking into a building that asks them the same essential questions, which helps us to contact trace every child 
in every location, every day that they're there. And so with those procedures and with parents keeping kids home if they were exposed to someone or out of fear if they see a, a news media report, we're, we're expecting to have 20 to 30 percent of students not even come to school if they have a desire and right to because it's their day of school based off of precautions alone of screening and or fear and protection. So ultimately, uh, we do think it's possible, but our reality will be different. School will be different and, cons- and consistent attendance is a thing of the past. We are looking at safety first. And who will be managing all of this? Who will be doing the screenings, making sure students are moving? Are, are teachers expected to be involved? So in our setting, it's uh, a nurse for sure. It's the principal. It's an office staff person or security person because our schools have school resource officers. So it's school resource officers. It's nurses. It's a nurse's aide. It's a, uh, a principal or assistant principal. And between that team of four individuals, it's just like lunch duty where the principal, assistant principal does lunch duty and you have a hall monitor. This time it's COVID interest of school duty where you have a, a nurse, a nurse's assistant, a, uh, a security person or school resource officer, and the principal. So the teacher should be responsible for the second layer of screening. Just like when a student arrives to a classroom, the first thing every teacher knows to do is to greet the student and then take attendance. Oftentimes because of ADA purposes for reimbursement and funding, but also to just make sure you have high attendance. Well, now the first thing you do when a student comes to the class is take the, have them take the self-screener by device, tablet, and or by paper um, so that you can know whether that person says yes to any of the symptoms and especially the high-risk symptoms of coughing, not being able to smell or taste, and, uh, and difficulty breathing. Um, and then the second that they say yes to any of the high-risk symptoms or any symptom is the second that the teacher should then send them out of their classroom immediately to what's called a care room in our system. But statewide in the state of Missouri, I helped to write the MSBA COVID plan, and we called it uh, care rooms in that document too, but we also call it isolation rooms. Our isolation rooms are monitored by baby monitors so that there doesn't have to be a person in it, but there could be a device to know when a person walks in. And then that child who says yes should be in an isolation room sitting 13 feet apart from anybody else who's in there, uh, ultimately with a mask on and being monitored by the nurse or a secretary while the nurse is doing the general screening of everybody coming in. So that that will become more of a norm of a procedure. Um, Schools will have to eventually send kids back home if those symptoms are directly uh, a threat for them and others to have COVID so that you can isolate and keep away uh, anyone who possibly has COVID and check those symptoms every 48 hours, if not for 14 days, uh, but 48 hours. So that leads us to the need for more funding and what I call and what most experts call rapid nasal testing, COVID testing. Every school needs rapid nasal or swab COVID testing to get results in five minutes uh, at the least or 24 hours at the most so that you don't have to send home droves of kids for checking yes to any of those one symptoms. So it's not until we have that, and that may cost approximately $600 million to occur across the nation for about 100 million, 120 million people coming inside of our schools on a daily basis. But ultimately, those rapid tests will be essential for stability of attendance in school. And so that's why I say it's going to be about two years before we have uh, that type of uh, equipment distributed across the nation, uh, accessible, affordable enough uh, for every school to have 24-hour rapid nasal testing in order to not send the kid home the second they got there and said they had a symptom. I'm talking with Superintendent Art McCoy of the Jennings School District about how schools are approaching reopening their classrooms in the fall. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. 
Welcome back to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Emily Woodbury, and I'm here with Superintendent Art McCoy of the Jennings School District. We're talking about the guidelines developed for school districts to reopen their facilities this fall. I'd like to play part of a conversation I had last week with the chair of the Department of Teacher Education at Webster University. His name is Basir Rodney, and he mentioned that schools shouldn't be shouldering the entire burden of keeping students and teachers safe. He mentioned that he wishes a separate health organization would come in to help schools through this process. I mean, imagine, oh goodness, little Johnny shows up and he's running a fever. What do we do, right? Depending on his age. If the middle schooler, he showed up by himself. Do they ride the same bus to school, right? So I think there's so many logistical things that needs to be ironed out. You almost need a whole different group of people to help you manage that. Schools are not equipped for this. It's it's not what they were built to do. Um, So it's almost like we're giving them, we're giving them a whole new mandate on top of the one they already have. And and I think most people are just gonna adopt a wait and see approach. We assume resources are coming, right? Uh, we don't say it, but I think secretly and subtly, we all assume that some fund is there that's going to give us 20 more people in the schoolyard to help us to work through this thing. I, that's probably a poor assumption. We also heard a similar concern from a parent on Facebook. Lauren says, I wonder about the financial support or complete lack thereof for schools to properly deal with this and get kids back safely. I'm so saddened that the government is not putting their money where their mouth is. Money talks. I hear nothing in support of teachers, schools, and students. So, Superintendent McCoy, I I wonder, the picture you paint of your school needing more equipment, PPE, staff being tasked with additional duties, it makes me wonder whether the guidelines given to St. Louis County schools are helpful or if they're just asking schools schools to do too much with too little? Um, okay, so as a leader, uh, see, let me say this. Uh, optimists say it's okay, we'll make it work, or to go away, or to work together for good. Testimists say this is too much, we can't do it, it's not feasible, um, I don't see any way it's possible. Leaders are a thermostat, and we change the, the, the temperature of the climate, we make it happen. And that's the mode that I'm in, leadership mode, as a leader of over 3,000 uh, families, and then my own staff, 500, and then uh, helping the region to write the goals, and helping the state to write the goals. And so I'm changing the thermostat. And so that's my first preface. Part two is I'm helping to write part of the HEROES Act that is going to the Senate, the Republican mostly majority Senate, this July uh, and will be debated on the floor the second and the third week of July. Uh, And ultimately in that, I've asked for $600 million uh, to be brought to the floor of the U.S. Senate just for the rapid nasal testing piece alone, not to mention uh, uh, some significant dollars for professional development for teachers and staff on COVID and on innovation so that they could know how to be as innovative as uh, our system and how agile our system has been to actually have students in a high transmission district. Uh, all of that is has to be funded to some degree because it is unfair to ultimately expect things to be like it was in BC before COVID without leadership and support, uh, you know, re- resources during BC, which is during COVID. And then it's going to definitely take innovation to become to come to a phase of AC after COVID, which which means COVID has no threat to our life and things can go to a better tomorrow. So ultimately, more funding is needed. I think the Heroes Act that is going to be debated on the floor is one source of funds that that must be used for this out of the 3.3 trillion that the that the Democratic uh, House has ultimately submitted for the then Republican majority Senate to then revise, rebut, and so forth, which the president said was dead on the arrival based off of the uh, House version, but I don't think it's dead on the Senate version if we're really going to expect to have people go back to schools. So funding is needed. It doesn't have to just be government funding. It could be private funding, uh, public-private partnerships, and more. The bottom line is I am a public servant as a publicly paid superintendent, and I and my group of warriors uh, who are educators in my system choose to serve the public. And so we will have school daily for preschoolers through third graders daily, but with appropriate distance, PPE, contact tracing, testing, agile quick responses, and screenings. 
And ultimately, for grades 4 through uh, through 12, we will have an A day, B day, every other day schedule for those students, online access for all students whose families choose to not come from preschool through 12th grade. And then ultimately, we'll have professional development community-wide, school-wide, and so forth. So it can be done. What I want your audience to know is that BC schooling, schooling before COVID, will never come back again, just like BC, the BC era will never be back again. Not until there is a vaccine that can get distributed to every uh, every living person. Even after it's created, most people don't want to take vaccines. Just think about those who don't even take flu shots. So, so the bottom line is it's going to take years before people even trust to take a vaccine for COVID, let alone a flu shot. Therefore, we're going to be in the D.C. during COVID era until at least 22 because of the need for time to even distribute a solution. Therefore, as a public servant, we have to move at the speed of the need, at the level of need, on the basis of how safe we can implement it. And finally, we we have just a minute left, but, um, you know, in the, the final few seconds, I'm just curious, you know, what would you like parents to keep in mind ahead of the next school year? I want parents to keep in mind that we are in this together, that we appreciate and want your feedback. We want you to demand the highest of expectation from us, but we also want you to know that not every question will have an answer and that we must be agile, which means willing to change. And that's not just them as parents, but that's us as systems leaders and educators and professionals. We all must be willing to change to improve our systems because every public school or other school is only as good as is public. Therefore, let's make the public the strongest, the wisest on behalf of our community safety and our entire global safety for public health, but also for continued learning so that we can be an educated electorate and continue a very strong city, county, state, and nation. Superintendent McCoy, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for your time. Art McCoy is the superintendent of the Jennings School District. This is St. Louis on the Air. I'm Emily Woodbury. We're talking about how schools are approaching the reopening of classrooms in the fall. And perhaps there's no group more excited for a return to in-person learning than the parents who found themselves suddenly homeschooling this spring. But parents are also apprehensive, and that's not just about exposure to COVID-19, but about the fact that achievement gaps are likely to widen significantly because of the coronavirus pandemic. My next guests are two parents that are acting on that concern. Crystal Barnett is a St. Louis mother of two, and she's the executive director of the newly formed organization Bridge to Hope St. Louis, which aims to help to elevate parent voices in conversations about education. It's run by and for parents and grandparents whose, children's, whose children attend or are zoned to chronically low-performing schools. Crystal, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thank you, Emily, for having me here. And also joining us is Janice Rideout. She's raising her two grandsons, aged 12 and 14. Hi, Janice. Hi, Emily. Thank you for having yeah. me on. Thanks for being on. So I'm curious, you know, as parents, how are you both feeling about your kids returning to school in the fall? Crystal, do you want to start us off? Um, after listening to what Art McCoy said, I do see that they took precautions to bring the safety back into the space. But school is a learning institution. And the one thing that concerns me the most is that while we're doing all of our safety precautions, that students are still not learning in the appropriate time frames that are provided to them or on the appropriate levels for them to be a success, which is what school is created for. Yeah. And Janice, what's on your mind, particularly after uh, hearing that conversation? I'm still kind of leery by sending the children back. Um, even though he talks about the precautions that he has, but he didn't talk about if a child refuses to wear the mask while they in school. Uh, how are they going to handle that if they have children in school and they don't want to ma- wear the mask all day long? Are they going to send them home? You know, how are they going to deal with those type of issues there? And then when the children go to the bathroom, how are they going to handle that issue to make sure that these kids are washing their hands and they are sanitizing their hands the way they should? Mm-hmm. And Janice, what what would it take for you um, 
what would you like to hear from administrators that would make you feel more confident um, having kids re-enter the classroom? Um, I believe I would feel a little bit better if they really have the prop- proper staff at the school. And, you know, he talked about the $6 billion for this and that. Well, can't they get a budget to add more teachers to the school, have teachers aides in the school, uh, let the parents come up in the school, and just watch and see what's going on. Our children are failing. I mean, our children are passing with D's now. And we're talking about COVID, but this really goes beyond COVID. Our mm-hmm. children are really failing. They have let our children down. The school system has let our children down. And as a parent, I'm a grandmother. And one school I went to just so I can see what they're doing there, see how my grandson is acting there. Um, I can even go up in the school unless I have an appointment to get up in the school. And then once I get that appointment and get there, I'm sitting downstairs for 30 minutes before someone will come to interact with me. So I just think that the school needs to be more open with the parents. The parents need to get on board with the school. We do have a voice. Let's go to the PTO meetings. Let's go to these meetings so we can see exactly what's going on in the school. Mm-hmm. And Crystal, um, as Janice mentioned, you know, your your group is focused on Um, some of the challenges posed by COVID-19, but it's also focused on the broader issues that face this region. And last week, your organization, Bridge to Hope St. Louis, released a manifesto including those concerns and demands for policy changes. Um, You know, the group's concerned about, as we mentioned, existing achievement gaps that are likely to widen um, from the COVID crisis. Let's run through that list. So one of the concerns is closing the digital divide before schools reopen. Um, Expand on that a little bit. What do you mean by that? So we know that when COVID-19 happened, that uh, devices were supposed to be given out by school districts to students. But what the entire world got to see is that every student was not provided either the device that they need or they didn't have access to internet in their homes, even if they had devices, or they didn't know how to use those devices. To me, when we talk about closing the digital divide, it's with educating folks on how to use the technology, making sure every house has access to internet, and making sure that technology is relevant to the student at the level that they're on. We need to close the gap that stops people from even learning during such a time like quarantine where schools were not even open at all, but school was still in and happening. Another of your demands has to do with teacher engagement and individualized learning. Um, What do you mean by that? What's an individualized approach look like? An individualized approach to us looks like a real intake a form that's a real document, that's a live document used in every school for every student, where parents and teachers and administrators alike both understand what their child needs and what their roles are to help their child be the best success they can be through academics. And it also should cross districts, meaning no matter where that child is, everybody knows what's going on and what it's going to take. Mental health, uh, trauma, academics, uh, social interests, And then where the child's strengths and weaknesses are, we need to really do and start valuing children as individuals and stop looking at them as like groups of people who all think and and learn the same. And it strikes me that that is particularly important now. I mean, we knew these students, some of them were dealing with trauma before the pandemic hit. But now that we have this pandemic, I just feel like kids today are dealing with so much stress, so much uncertainty. So they could really benefit by, like you said, not just focusing on their schoolwork, but how they're doing mentally. Yeah, we're going to have to keep in mind that even a child who before COVID-19 did not have any anxieties or maybe stresses. COVID-19 has created stress, new stresses for, for all people. So imagine us as adults trying to navigate and then think about how a child is trying to navigate the non-normalcy of our world as it stands right now. 
I'd like to play a short clip from a sit-in yesterday afternoon. This was outside the administration building of St. Louis Public Schools, the administrative building, rather. Um, Dozens of St. Louis teachers were protesting, saying they don't feel their voices are being heard as schools consider reopening this fall. Ribbon Williams was there. She's a fifth grade teacher with Patrick Henry Downtown Academy. That's part of St. Louis Public Schools. And she says she loves her students but doesn't want to risk their lives by going back to school unprepared. I feel wholeheartedly what is best for students is for them to be alive. It doesn't matter what book I open if you are not here to read it. And we have to make it safe for students to be inside of buildings. Teacher Ribbon Williams also says there's already a shortage of teachers. We already were short teachers before COVID. Where are we going to staff? Where are we getting these these people to teach? Where are we getting staff from? Where are we getting bus drivers from, custodians to sanitize and clean? Where is that coming from? I haven't seen to date anything that supports us being ready to go back into buildings. Not one single thing. I saw a document that said what we would like to have happen, but what are you going to do to support that happening? I don't I haven't seen anything. Those documents should have come side by side. So, Crystal, I'd love to have you respond to her comments. Um, you know, when we talk about um, teachers having this individualized approach, I mean, she's worried that we don't even have enough teachers to get through the basics. Are you and concerned think, that'll be a tough order? I think it'll be a tough order, but it's one that I believe schools and school leaders should have been thinking about. This Everybody's talking about this issue as if it started with COVID-19. Students were failing in schools, not being able to read and do basic things that would help move them along in education before COVID-19 started. And now the quarantine has happened. We have widened that gap of the non-learning of students and, and now what she said is accurate. Where are you going to get these teachers from? And why is that not a conversation that was happening before now? I'm talking with Crystal Barnett. She's the executive director of the newly formed organization Bridge to Hope St. Louis, which aims to elevate parent voices in conversations about education. Also joining us is Janice Rideout. She's raising her two grandsons aged 12 to 14. And we're talking about several of the demands of the organization. And Crystal, you, another another point is that you wish that um, teachers or administrators actually would respect parents' wishes more. Um, you talk about choice. Can you can you expand on that a bit? We know that uh, parent choice option is probably one of the most important things, especially happening right now. And parents need to have options and choices on how their students are educated without the backlash or the um, constant force to bring students in the spaces that they don't feel either welcomed in or that they're not learning in. So such as now where parents have the options to go into brick and mortar and or virtual. My question to schools would be with all the time that we've been off and all the things we have learned even since COVID-19 hit our world, why are we not working on options for students that don't put any person in danger, but closing that digital divide and working on other things that will help educate students, even if we have to stay out of brick and mortar right now? Mm-hmm. And Crystal, where can people go to get more involved with uh, Bridge to Hope St. Louis's efforts? Now, Bridge to Hope St. Louis, we are on Facebook. It's www.facebook.com forward slash B2HSTL. We're also on Instagram and Twitter. And I can be reached by phone or email, which is also on our Facebook page. Crystal and Janice, I want to thank you both so much for making the time to join me today. Crystal Barnett is the executive director of Bridge to Hope St. Louis. And Janice Rideout is a mother and grandmother who works with the group. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.